Before I go ahead and share this week's episode, I want to let you know that we talk about child sexual abuse. And so if this is a topic that has the ability to make you feel a certain way, this is a topic that you do not wish to dive into or listen to, this is your opportunity to opt out. On today's episode, I am joined by Caroline Bruni, who is a survivor coach, author, professional speaker, and entrepreneur. From her lived experience of childhood sexual abuse and incest, Caroline has shifted her trauma into transformation. Caroline shares how she has began her healing journey and actively guided both survivors and supporters by teaching them the power of being allies whilst walking beside survivors as they face the complexities within their journey of healing. She is paving the way for survivors to remove the shame that has silenced them by owning their voices and knowing that there are so much more than what has happened to them. I loved this conversation with Caroline. It is a heavy conversation. We talk about topics that can be deeply uh, trauma uh, triggering, but they're necessary conversations to have. We speak to the book, the memoir that Caroline has written uh, about the fact that you can be more than one thing. And she shares her story of survival. She is somebody who is deeply knowledgeable tender in the way she shares and holds space. And one of my biggest takeaways was what we can do as caregivers, as parents, guardians, to keep our children better protected as they're growing up. And um, also, allow yourself time as you are watching or listening to this episode. It goes on for about an hour. So give yourself time. And I do have a giveaway at the end of the episode. And so listen until the end. We are represented. We are represented. We are represented. Welcome to Represented, the podcast. I'm Aniki Shiru, racial equity coach for online business owners who want to be intentionally inclusive by building a business that is racially equitable. I created this podcast to normalize the conversation around racial inclusion so that fear is no longer the barrier that gets in the way of doing this work. This isn't about perfection, it's about progress. Whether you're taking your first steps or you're well-versed in the journey towards racial equity, this space is for you. So welcome home, friend. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Represented Podcast with Aniki Shiru. And today I am joined by the wonderful uh, Caroline Bruni, who is a fellow coach, um, as well as just a human who is pushing the boundaries that need to be pushed. She is somebody who is speaking up for something that is truly, truly important, and we need to listen up. Caroline, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I am incredibly grateful to have you here. This is such a different conversation than I have ever had before. I have found myself spending time um, listening to your memoir. Um, more than one thing can be true. I can see it right behind you. Uh, Story of Survival. It is a book that has been uh, written in a way that is obviously the tragedy of it, but there's a tenderness that mm. came through. And I don't know if, if it's because I'm listening to your voice as you share. Which is a lot, right? To listen to the to the person. Yes. And then there's there's just this tenderness, but there's a rawness to uh what is being shared. And 
as you've been walking me through and I've been listening to you and your childhood sexual abuse, has the writing of your story, and I know this happened like three years ago, we were just um, talking about before I press record, has it been part of your healing process, the writing? Mm. The writing definitely was. I made a decision when I decided to disclose my lived experience to my sister. That was the, the key part of this story at um, in 2020. When I decided to make that decision, um, I knew that something else needed to come of this story. Um, but I knew that I've been in business a really long time. I've had the opportunity to do many, many exciting things. And a book was just go always going to be the, the safest space for me. There's time and thought and rest that comes in the writing process. And I've always loved writing, but I never actually saw myself as someone that would write a book. So that in itself was a bit daunting. Um, but I found the process of being able to pull lots of different things, um, notes from journals, um, notes from other coaching um, that I had done with my coaches. Um, I found some old journals and diaries from when I was a child. Um, there was a lot. There was a lot that I pulled from. There was a lot that I was hoping I would be able to pull from and realise that like a lot of journal entries, they don't make a lot of sense when you read them afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, but it could, it, that whole process of pulling it all back together and also piecing together my memory in a lot of ways, I reached out to friends, friends, um, I reached out to other people that were significant in my life at different points and just got them to relay who they remember and, and how they remember me to be because a big part of trauma is that you lock a lot of things away but you don't get to pick and choose the memories that you keep. Um, I have a lot of real black spots in my memory and friends especially school friends will say oh remember when we did this and this and that and 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 I listen to the story like I'm watching a movie I I have a taste of it like a movie I've already watched so I think is I kind of remember that but mm -hmm. it's not tangible enough because the unfortunate truth is if I unlock that day month year I have to unlock a lot of other trauma and other memories that were happening at that point in time. And so it all gets locked away. Uh, so there was a real understanding that came from unlocking certain boxes and doors that helped me then share my story and helped me become a little more whole. Mm. And what was then the de deciding factor you know, sitting down with your sister back in 2020, sharing with her something incredibly traumatic. What was the deciding factor that you were going to put this in a book and knowing how public that would be and knowing that this, the context of it, um, family uh, and so many other things and especially being brought up in a migrant family where things, just everyday things are just kept so personal, um, let alone when something like this has happened. Mm -hmm. um, what was the deciding factor? I needed something that I could use to reference when things got hard be it from family. Uh, so the original plan was to disclose to my sister and then to start speaking to family members. Um, I come from a really big migrant family. I, I speak about that really early in the book. And so I knew there were going to be conversations that I would need to have or that funnily enough, I didn't end up having, I didn't have a lot of conversations in the end, but I thought that there could be conversations coming and that sometimes it's hard to have those conversations. So having another tool 
that I could reference. So I didn't necessarily have to repeat myself over and over again, especially with some of the more difficult components of the trauma. Um, as you know, uh, as someone who is reading my memoir, I don't share any details. Yeah. I don't talk about the physicality of the abuse. I don't, you know, it's not gory. It's not necessarily even that hard to read through at times because I wanted it to be trauma informed and I didn't want to re traumatize survivors who chose to read the work. Um, and it was the same intention with potential family members reading it. I knew that as they read through this, it wasn't fiction. These were people that they know and love. And I wanted them to be able to digest the information as safely as possible if I couldn't have those conversations with them. I was also really mindful that I don't even think it comes from migrant families. I think just humans. We really struggle in this space of incest and family abuse. It's complex and heartbreaking and it is one of the few taboos that still exist that we still struggle to speak about. Um, we see currently the taboo of family violence that we now can speak about when not that long ago these incidents were happening behind closed doors in families and, and it was a taboo that we didn't talk about. But the sexual violence that happens in families is still a taboo that we're not talking about. And so I knew that there were going to be family members and probably are still family members that still don't, are not comfortable to speak to me directly, but my book is accessible everywhere. They can download it through Audible if they want to hear it. They can purchase it through, you know, Booktopia if, if they don't want me to know that they've read it. Um, and that created a sense of space for people that may want to process that information in their own time and in their own way. And so two years since the publication of the book, it being out there in the world, how is Caroline doing? Oh, it's a very big question, Annie. Um, it depends on the day. I am still navigating what I class as the ocean of grief. Uh, I am estranged from multiple family members and the ripple effect of that estrangement means that I am distanced from other family members. I choose not to participate and attend larger family gatherings and, and moments like that because I'm mindful that I entering that space means that people have to choose and most family gatherings are for an occasion. It's such and such as birthday or wedding or a baby has arrived and I don't want to take from the joy that is these occasions, but I'm mindful that if I enter a space and someone says, oh, even not really like just off the cuff, oh, how is such and such? Or have you spoken to this person? Or how are you doing? I, I have to choose if I answer honestly or if I put on another mask and, and, and just you know, go with the flow of things. And that's really difficult to do when I actively, bravely take steps forward every day to not have to you know, do that anymore. Um, so within that distance comes a lot of grief. I, I am grieving people that are still alive and that in itself is really difficult. And like anything when it comes to grief, and, and I think that a lot of us have experienced grief of, of different gravities and grief is this thing that doesn't always, it's not linear. The smallest thing can trip me up and then there can be days where I just don't think about it and I, I'm just, you know, I have my immediate, my, my 
family, I have my work, I have so many beautiful things in my life and, and I don't I don't think about it. So yeah, I think it changes every day. Today is a good day. Today is a day where life is good. I'm really, I'm in a really beautiful place. I've got some very exciting things coming up on the horizon, which I'm very excited about. Um, but yeah, you don't know. I don't I never really know what's around the corner. Yeah, um, that is so true. It reminds me of, I think it was chapter 19, and I should have mentioned this before we, we started recording because there's a snippet from the memoir that I would have loved you to read for us. And um, it's really significant when you talk about how um, bravery cannot exist without fear. Mm. And that it was such a powerful statement. And I don't know if you're, if you're able to take us to that particular part and, and perhaps read a little bit for us because I want anybody who's listening and perhaps still kind of trying to figure out what is the story here um and and I guess without giving the entire story away you know Caroline was sexually abused as a child 12 years old Caroline right? I was 10 10 mm, yeah 10 years old by her father mm. um and that went on for many years and at some point when it did stop through an argument that had erupted and out of nowhere, you 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 blurted it out and you you told your mom. Mm. But that's not where it ends. Mm. Nothing changed. Nothing was done. Mm. You continued to live in the same house. Mm. You nothing changed their marriage did not change there was um your sister who is younger than you who was in the same home your brother left after you know um you shared that news so there's a lot here for somebody who's listening and going like <laughs> there's, a, there's a pretty lot there's a whole lifetime's worth of a story there and it is it's it the uh, and I guess those points are really significant so the first thing that people try to digest is the fact that I was abused as a child by my father. That in itself is, is so difficult for people to understand and digest. We struggle enough with child sexual abuse. When we add um, incest or family abuse to the mix, it, it, it creates a deep uncomfortable like you feel it in your body and I know that when I sit in interviews like this I watched the host kind of wiggle a little bit because it's you feel it in your body it's a visceral uncomfortable moment but where the story becomes more complex is when I disclose to my mother and though the disclosure itself is in such a horrible way, we're in a massive argument. And even as I describe that and the way that I describe that, that's how it feels at the time. I relate that to those war scenes in movies where a grenade goes off and you you can't hear and your ears are ringing and you're trying to get your vision back because you can't work out where the pieces are and who, who made it through the explosion and, and as you calibrate over the hours and days to come, you're trying to work out the lay of the land. In my case, all those pieces were patched back together again as, as much as they could and everyone was given their scripts again and we shot the next scene. Um, and I always share that my mum did send me to a psychologist. There was mental health support offered, but she made decisions that I wouldn't make as a mother and another decade gone, another decade gone, and and I didn't leave or disclose to my sister until my late 30s. And as I said, the abuse started when I was 10, so it... It's a long time and for those who are listening who may have family members 
who have been abused because it's very common in families, unfortunately. But because it is such a big taboo, we don't talk about it and and it it's it's still so hidden. There are many of us who are still in our family settings because it's complicated and we have love for the people who often hurt us. And at the same time, there's nowhere to go. Uh, there's the family unit, the institution of family, as I call it, it is a structure designed for a reason and our internal needs and we think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we are wired to seek safety in family and the brain can do some pretty magnificent things to trick us into taking a small percentage of safety for fear of the unknown outside of that institution. So, yeah, it is very complex and that is a very small snippet of the story and and I guess what it looks like to carry trauma from an incident of trauma in active trauma where the abuse occurs to the ongoing trauma of living in shame and silence and and playing a role when internally your body is telling you that you are eroding from the inside. As a mother myself and going back to being a 10-year-old and just, just so many things are just going on in my mind and just thinking first and foremost the duty of care to a child the duty of care um and how that the neglect all that was missing um and now you choosing to live in what you describe as an island you've left the mm-hmm. mainland and now you're living in your island that you can control but keep yourself protected um I wonder, how did your family receive the news of the memoir and you finally breaking your silence and sharing your story publicly because there is a part in the memoir where you share, you came together, you Mm. sat down and you had a conversation. Yeah, so the the time where we get together is before I release, Um, so before I publish my memoir. I did share with everyone that I was going to write um, and before I actually had printed copies weeks before I released to the public and um, I sent a copy to my mother, my brother and my sister. So it was published, it was ready to go um, and I can't say if my mother or my brother have read my memoir I they've never told me I know my brother has read his chapter um there is a chapter dedicated to each of my family members and also my husband and my sons um each of my family members including my father so there is a letter there's a chapter and a letter for for each of them and um that was really important to me to have some dialogue directed to each and every one of them uh, in a way that they knew that they had been considered in this process. Now, I understand we're all human beings and and they may not agree with even the fact that it's out there. Um, But as I've always said since I released my memoir, it's not, it's actually, it no longer belongs to me. It it's a tool for survivors. It's something I needed when I was a child and a teenager. I spent too many years of my life thinking I was the only one um, or the, the rare one that I knew of people that had been abused in their families, be it through media or whatever, And a lot of those stories were really sensationalized um, and almost fetishized as well in a way, the way that Hollywood can fetishize these stories. 
and I didn't see myself in any of those stories, but I had never come across a story like mine where the abuse had stopped but everyone just remained, as I said, in their roles. And then on the flip side of that, if you take this one piece, which is a, a really important piece of safety, psychological, physical and, and emotional safety, if you take that aside for a second, I didn't want for anything else. I was fed, I was educated, I had amazing opportunities and I was loved. Um, and so it's this more than one thing can be true, which is exactly the theme right through the whole book because it's complicated to live a life where I've, I have the most beautiful memories of all the incredible things that I've had the opportunity to do and so many markers of my own values, interests and even mannerisms that I know I received from my parents whilst missing this underlying emotional, psychological and physical safety. Um, so I guess to go back to your question about, you know, how did they feel or, or what have they said, I don't know um, how they feel. I don't think that um, they've read my memoir. I don't know anything about my father in the sense that uh, the copy I sent was sent to their home to address to my mother, but it's somewhere there unless it was thrown out. And I don't think knowing my mother, I don't think that's what would have happened, um, but it is somewhere there. And it, I know the internet and social media is a funny place where you can not know about something that exists and, and it can completely miss your radar because of algorithms and whatever else. But at the same time, when you are so closely connected to someone through things like social media, um, we're not very far removed from people, um, it's pretty obvious that it's there. And if they wanted to listen to it on Audible or, or purchase a copy that I didn't know that had been purchased, it can be done. So uh, I know that recently um, my sister had a conversation with my mother and she just shared that she hopes that she can see that I've taken my story and this work and my sole purpose now is to support others and to support survivors in their healing and their understanding of their trauma and how they can move with it. Um, and that was all that was said. Um, I, I don't poke and prod too much about those private conversations that I'm not in, involved in um but i know that 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 conversation happened and and i'm really glad that my sister can at least share those little snippets on my behalf um but who knows there's still many more years to come i guess there, yes there, there, there still is and so you're now um a survivor coach you are supporting other people who have gone through something similar. But in order to support others, you have received support. It is so clear and evident. The tone of the book, if I may say, has been written with love. It's been written with a lot of tenderness. I have not felt any anger come across. Mm -hmm. And I was angry. Like, I <laughs> I was busy doing my chores, busy ironing, and yeah, I, no, it, it's one of those books where, like, if you're doing other things, and then you're like, oh, I've wait, been driving, I was <laughs> listening, and I'm angry. I'm, I'm literally there's this pain in my heart, and but your tone is so soothing, so tender. There hasn't been, and I'm sure the anger is there is a chapter. chapter. There, there is a chapter about anger. I will. I, it, it's not ruthless, but it there, there there is a mention of anger in there. The moaning, the groaning, the pain that just kind of hits you from from nowhere. You could be just having a good day, and then it just dawns on you, mm -hmm. or it comes flooding. Um, what kind of support? have you received um, to get to where you are today? Where did you begin? Because the beginning, again, that got me upset as well, being sent to a psychologist who was oh. a man the same age as your dad. Like, just... <laughs> 
Yes. Sometimes when I think back to those moments, especially when I've shared them in my memoir or with others, and they, people are like, what? A yes, sorry. I get it. I get the reaction. Um, it's baffling in so many ways. Mm -hmm. um, but, yes, so interestingly enough, yes, I did receive um, care from a psychologist and he wasn't a terrible psychologist, but you know, I wouldn't pick him again. I wouldn't send anyone to him these days. Um, I have had different therapy at different points in time because I've had different significant issues that have popped up. So when I had my first son, I was, it was a couple of months before I turned 22. I was probably still a baby myself in many ways. Um, and then within six months, we, I couldn't, Initially, they thought I had postnatal depression and it was very clear that it wasn't. So I ended up seeing a therapist at the time and it was the first time I had seen a therapist at a, um, a sexual violence clinic. So that in itself was specialist care and I worked with her for a series um, all funded through the clinic, which is amazing. That clinic still exists here on the Gold Coast and I now get to do work with them. So I, I've had a full circle moment, which is so beautiful. To I recently um, visited the centre when I first moved here and, and started establishing roots here and, and I've been able to go back and kind of thank them for the work that I did with them 20 years ago and, and just to see that they're still doing brilliant work in the community, which is amazing. Um, so I had that kind of care. I worked with different therapists and specialists over the years. It's normally been at different points in time. Um, trauma is carried and it it comes up and shows up in different ways and triggered, is triggered by different things. As I've gotten older, I have definitely found that I need a full whole person approach to, my, to the support that I need. Um, and so... I have done, I guess the most traditional therapy that I have done in recent years is EMDR therapy through a psychologist, which was really powerful to take another step in unlocking um, memories, but also take another step in desensitizing triggers that were still causing me physical distress. Um, so that's been really powerful and something I highly recommend that people investigate if they physically struggle with simple things like just being jumpy or, you know, someone will touch them on the shoulder and that will send them into a, a trigger and a reaction to a memory. So that has been really powerful to just reclaim my body. Um, most recently I've been doing more somatic work. So I am now trained and qualified to be a breathwork facilitator as I have, you know, learned about breathwork and loved it and wanted to share that with my own community and really just slowing down. I found that the things that always serve me best are the things that we have access to that are free, our breath, our nutrition, clean water, sleep, and just having good people around you, keeping your circle tight, I have a beautiful dog that is may as well be my therapy dog. <laughs> um, just things like that. So it changes. I, as I mentioned, I, as I may have mentioned, I've worked with lots of wonderful coaches and a huge shout out to Julie Parker, who we both love and know. Uh, so I met Julie and worked with her and Kemi Nekvapil in 2019, um, which was a really significant year for me and some big groundswell that I wasn't even aware that was happening um, because at the end of 2019 was when I decided that I was going to disclose to my sister. So after spending a year with Julie and Kemi, that, that's what came of that. I did some one-on-one -on -one sessions with Kemi at the end of 2019 and I made those big decisions and walked into 2020 with that plan um, and then worked with Kemi for um, three years after that one-on-one -on -one, as I disclosed to my family, I wrote my memoir. She was my coach throughout that process. So in addition to talk therapy, somatic, 
I, I've had a pretty amazing team and I call it scaffolding. I think there's there's a whole raft of scaffolding that survivors need. Um, and the other piece that I will mention that's really, really important and that I have found that I lean into probably first before I even seek external support is peer support. You can't be what you can't see. We talk about that a lot in the inclusion and diversity space. But as a survivor, I didn't know there were other survivors like me and I felt alone. And in seeing other survivors who I have seen now, especially um, there's an incredible um, woman based in the US and she has a book with a compilation of stories of incest survivors, many of which have lived lives like mine where they have lived in the same house. They have done, but like the stories are so similar to mine and I didn't find those until I started researching for my book. So if my story and me sharing on platforms like yours today are opportunities for a survivor who thinks they are alone can see that there's someone else that understands and there's someone else that's finding ways to continue to take steps forward, then that's really important to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you cannot be what you cannot see. Mm. And given the, the stigma around this, the, the hiddenness, the, the silence, the secrecy, it makes it even that much more harder to come across that. Um, you mentioned about diversity, equity and inclusion, and it kind of segues quite well into my next question, which it talks about intersections, the intersections that you yourself carry as being a migrant woman of colour um, and a survivor. Uh, we continue to witness how cases of Black, Indigenous and you know, women of colour being treated so differently than white women. We've very recently seen when it comes to gender-based violence that when it is Indigenous or women of colour who are the targets, it is not as amplified mm -hmm. as when it is white women. Then we're getting the whole nation is up in arms, people are speaking up. Um, what has been your experience when you've been in white spaces advocating and supporting, you know, victims and being with survivors, um, what has your experience been? Has the level of amplification been, been more centered to white women? Um, has it been the same? Has there been a difference? Oh, th this is a really complicated question for me. And I'll unpack it for you as I share, I guess to answer your question from the perspective of being in the sector, so the sector of uh, domestic family and sexual violence and the organisations, be it government organisations, um, government-funded organisations or not-for-profit and grassroots organisations, that's a whole sector and a whole industry. Yeah. Um, I'm technically in the sector but I'm technically not because I'm independent and I'm very new to the space. And I speak about that because in the last 18 months I have spoken at conferences and I have been tiptoeing into that space because I've been in, invited to speak or I've pitched to speak and, um, and I have been able to share parts of my story. I most recently was invited um, by the Commissioner for Domestic Family and Sexual Violence to attend a roundtable um, in Melbourne. And there were about 50 people from the sector, some like myself, who were contributing from a lived experience perspective. That room was diverse from all areas of diversity um, when when we, we look at the, the intersection that needs to exist there. The sector understand and the people that are doing this work, everyone is represented because everyone is impacted. Where it gets tricky is when the media gets involved and when, to a certain extent, government and politicians get involved. I know I was invited by the commissioner in her office um, 
But I think that's where we see the difference. Um, I adore Grace Tame. Um, she's someone that I've met a few times now and 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 we we speak when we get the opportunity to. I, I admire the work that she does, but I know that if someone had to choose between us to put on a stage from a media perspective, take away the fact that she was Australian of the Year, that's, that holds some pretty significant credentials, I know who they're going to pick from a media perspective. Like that's just a given. I need to add a little asterisk in there of my own lived experience that is very complicated and I, I probably need to unpack it with you on another day on, an, on another call. I have had an unusual experience of being what I would call as really white passing in my lifetime. I've had many occasions where people have said to me, lovely people have said to me, oh, do you class yourself as a woman of colour? And I've kind of squinted and gone, pardon? <laughs> and in one particular case, I had that conversation four times in a six-week block in a school setting, in a business setting, in another setting. And I was like, wait, what? Am I wearing white face? Like what? I don't understand what's happening. And I had a chat with a friend. She's like, oh, you're just really white passing. Like that's that's all it is. Like I know that that sounds strange, but you have worked out very like in whatever way how to make people not see your colour. And, and she said, I'm not saying that to be mean or to like, as an insult, it's a skill and it's a coping mechanism, but you've managed to do it in a way that people don't even notice it anymore. And I thought, yes, that, that, that is it. And so I am really mindful that when I pitch and I go into spaces that I do it consciously or subconsciously with this skill set of not necessarily shrinking myself because I'm not shrinking myself when I'm pitching to speak or whatever else, but there's this thing that I'm doing that is making people not see me in that way, taking that part of my identity away so we can focus on something else. Um, and it's very complicated in the sense that I don't even feel I have a lot of control over it. I don't know if it's just something that I, I've been doing for so long that, and I don't even know what it is. Like if I, if someone was to say, could you stop doing that? I, I wouldn't know what they meant, um, but it's very complicated. And I do sometimes look around and think, how, how did I end up here or what? Like, and, and I know that I work hard and I know that I speak on things that are difficult and I also have a lot of experience in public speaking and, and I can hold my own on stage and, and talk about hard things and, and keep composure and I play the perfect victim very well. I'm very mindful of that. Um, it is an optic that is challenging from a media perspective because we only ever see the perfect victims and we're high-functioning trauma survivors and we're just very good at hiding our trauma. Um, but adding the layer of being a woman of colour and a migrant, I think often gets forgotten when people put my name on the sheet of paper. As I said, something you and I can probably have a whole nother conversation about yeah. and unpack, right? That, that is a whole entire lifetime of a conversation for sure it takes me back to one of my current students inside my program represented she is a woman of color of Indian descent mm -hmm. and she has for most of her life worked to disassociate herself from that Indian heritage because it came as a disadvantage mm -hmm. it came as something where she would be viewed as less than and mm -hmm. so she is very um pale skinned and so she is extremely white passing and she has played to that mm -hmm. and 
every single turn she has yes. played to that strength that she, or that difference that mm. she has to disassociate and it hasn't been until now she has been unpacking this that she is seeing layer after layer after layer and kind of finding the answers as to what led her there mm. and when I was listening to your memoir and you talk about you know coming from Mauritius a beautiful island of Mauritius and not even being able to speak English uh, coming here as a little girl and interacting with your cousins and looking at them in awe and just saying oh I look forward to the point in time when I will be like them I'll be mm -hmm. able to in, speak like them and just and so there's that added layer and complexity of moving to a country where you're not seeing um, much of yourself represented or your heritage and wanting to be that thing that is the main thing that is the standard and mm -hmm. playing that um, dance yeah to be that Mm -hmm. And whatever might be of a disadvantage or might close doors, yeah, see you treated less than going mm -hmm. away from that, whether it's consciously or in this case would be very subconscious as a child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you are who you are now based on yeah. everything that you have built to be. Very much so. And I, I had this really interesting experience. I, in my you know mid-20s, worked in a role where I, when I started the role, I had, I inherited a team of five people and one of the women in the team was African and we became friends and um, I was friends with everyone in the team and years later we've, we've stayed in touch and we had coffee probably only about three or so years ago and she was sharing with me how disappointed she was when we first met she said I saw you and I was like oh my goodness a woman of color and she's going to be my team manager this is going to be amazing and she said within less than a day I was like oh she's not like she's not like me she's not like me at all and um and that was really hard to hear um but I completely understood what she meant I said yeah I I not even consciously, I was I was new in this role. I had inherited this new team, a massive portfolio. Um, I'd moved into state. At the time, no one knew that I was experiencing domestic violence at home in my marriage. I was also navigating the um the medical system to get my son funding for being neurodivergent and trying to navigate getting him in the system getting him onto medication. So I was getting calls from school every day. I was being abused by my ex-husband um, and I was managing a new portfolio and a brand new job. The last thing I was trying to do is like show up and be Mauritian. Like it was just the last thing on my mind. And also I had already spent 20 years not showing up being Mauritian. Um, and I said, oh, it's so fascinating that you share that with me. And I really appreciate it because I can imagine that would be really disappointing when you see someone and you have all these expectations and then they speak and you're like, it's just like a white person in a brown person's body. <laughs> yeah, sorry, that's kind yeah. of what you get sometimes. Um, I've had other experiences where my youngest son, we've been in a Mauritian gathering years ago and he was like, oh, what's that? And because they were doing some traditional Mauritian Sega dancing and I was like, how does he not know that? And I'm like, oh, wait, that's my job to teach him that. <laughs> so even moments like that where now that I'm older, I've realised how much I had to shed mm -hmm. to just fit in to the norm. And it's so sad and it was so long ago and there's still things I can do to just reclaim those parts of me. But, yeah, it, I, I'm, as I said, really mindful that going into spaces, especially new spaces where I carry the title of lived experience survivor, I also have all these intersections that it's almost like having a deck of cards and you've got to work out which one you're going to play because Who are you showing you're still up gotta, as? Yeah. It, it, it's a lot to carry. So there is that complexity. Um, and and I, I really needed to have that. Um, ask that question and 
have us discuss that because it's very much in line as to the people who are listening to this conversation. They're here to hear about representation. They're here to mm -hmm. learn about matters to do with diversity, equity, and inclusion um, for a parent. And we're now almost getting to the end. And I knew this conversation <laughs> would not be a short. Apologies if you were looking for a short episode today, guys. <laughs> you cannot shorten this. You cannot shorten responses. You cannot. Um, yeah. So for a parent listening or a caregiver, what are the things that they should be looking for or doing to keep their children better protected? Mm -hmm. I only very recently came across um, uh, a post on Instagram and it was a short reel, a short video. Um, there's this parenting uh, expert that I follow and she was talking about the sensitivity or the vulnerability of the ages of children between the age of seven, I think right up to 15 or 16. And the fact that she doesn't advocate for sleepover because that is such a tender age when they're being exposed to so many things. And this is when actually they could very easily get, you know, um, sexually abused. And um, as statistics, uh, you know, tell us it happens from somebody that is known to, um, you know, to the victim. And so um, what advice would you give to parents, caregivers, guardians who are trying to keep their children better protected? Trust your children and empower them with their own instincts and their own gut feel. So we try to get children to fit into boxes because we want them to behave. Now I understand children can be all over the shop and they want to do what they want to do when they're learning and they're pushing back and, and whatever else. But when we empower children to really tune in to their own instincts and when examples of you might even run into a friend at the shopping centre and your, your instinct is say hello, but your child goes, I don't know who this person is. And so they hide behind your leg or they don't want to say hello or they say hello, but then they don't want to give them a hug or whatever the other adult is prompting. That is such an opportunity for you to empower your child in their body. So no problems. You said hello. Oh, no problems. You're feeling a bit shy. That's completely fine. Or you don't want to say hello that's fine. This is mum's friend, not your friend, stranger to you. Totally cool. Um, it's so small, but every time we empower our children to know what, to trust what their bodies are telling them, we not only empower them, but we help them understand that we respect their bodies as well. So it's very subtle, but those little subtle moments can make the world of difference. Now, I understand in large migrant families, this one is tough. Don't make your kids hug and kiss everyone. I know it's part of tradition. I know the older generations are going to get really upset and they're going to tell you that your kids are rude or whatever, but it doesn't matter because the safety of your children and the trust they have that you will advocate for them and you know when your kids are just being rude and when there's something else going on, um, help them find a way of saying goodbye and hello in a way that makes them comfortable. Help them work out their own way. Really small. Like I'm starting with the basics here. As we move further in, um, take those micro opportunities to check in with your children Driving the car is normally the best time to be talking to kids about anything because you don't have to make straight eye contact with them. They don't feel like you're eyeballing them across the dining table. <laughs> They're just in the space and you can bring up conversations or um, if you hear a slang word that you don't understand because they've made a whole new language, this new generation, I'm very confused. What does that mean? Oh, well, if someone was to say that, how does it make you feel? Those sorts of things. Starting to build common language between their very strange gen alpha whatever we're up to language and you know common language so you can get a better understanding of what's happening how they're feeling when certain things are happening and then maybe just 
just throw in some scenarios. So if this was to happen and, um, you know, your teacher was to do this or um, you, if you went to a friend's house and their dad said this, what what would you do? How would that make you feel sort of thing? And And just gauge, one, how comfortable they are to have the conversation with you in the first place, two, what they say and how they feel and how in tune they are to that. And if you notice some gaps, you've got some work to do, like, it's time to have some more difficult conversations. They're normally more difficult for you than they are for the child. Um, as I said, I'm starting with the basics. There's all the biggest stuff and there's some incredible resources out there when it comes to child safety, but your connection and communication and instinct with your child, is this, that's going to be your backup through and through. You're going to know um, because something has changed. Just that example of saying hello to another adult. I think that that's that's my biggest takeaway. That is just mm. going to stay with me because so powerful, so relatable, and mm. something that I think all parents cool. do unknowingly, but that is a huge takeaway for me. Um there's a difference between counseling and coaching. Mm as you would know very, very well, you are a coach. How do you support your clients or anyone who's listening, thinking to themselves, I would love to have Caroline as my survivor coach. Could you just give us a little bit of a snippet because somebody might be thinking, I could come to you for counseling or therapy, but mm. Caroline's a coach. Yeah. Um, so please unpack that for us for somebody who's listening and thinking they'd love to connect with you in that capacity yeah definitely I think one of the key things that's really important is is the person in an active state of trauma and that could be they are still in the trauma they are experiencing family or domestic violence they are going through um, a cancer diagnosis and, and treatment trauma exists in lots of different ways it's not just the type of trauma we've talked about today um so in an active state of trauma there are professionals like counselors therapists psychologists who are designed and trained to support you in that work and I personally haven't chosen to do that work. So I'm very clear on where you are on that journey. Now, trauma isn't linear and we carry it with us. So there may be other stages that you reach in your life where you know that you want the support of a coach, but you want to know that that coach is trauma-informed, that they specifically know how to work with people that are trauma survivors and they're going to be able to get an understanding of your lived experience, but that the sessions don't need to be about your lived experience. Um, that my focus is on, I, I say that people move with trauma, they don't get over trauma. So my focus is to always say, well, how can we move with your trauma whilst you work on whatever it is you want to work on with me as a coach? So that's the key difference. Um, so I often use my discovery session and those first interactions to give the client an opportunity to share anything of their lived experience that they'd like me to know. And that's probably the only time we talk about the past. So it's their little window of opportunity to tell me anything they want to talk about um, because it's important for me to understand that foundation but it's also important for the person to only share what they wish to share. From there, we focus on the present into the future, knowing that they're carrying trauma with them and that trauma can trip us up. So what, what do we do if that if that comes along the way? Um, so, so at the moment, I have a coaching series, um, which is six sessions. But in the next month, I'll be offering a one-off um, 90 minutes, so 60 minutes and an additional 30 minutes. And I've just introduced breath work, which is different again to coaching, um, is a lot more somatic. And that's a new offering as well that can be accompanied with coaching if people want. Um, but as I said, very different experiences. So that's the most important part to understand. And I understand that when people are working with a coach, sometimes they are 
triggered back into active trauma, that's where the scaffolding comes in. So we don't necessarily need to stop our sessions. We can just say, okay, well, what additional support do you need and who's in your team? I want to be a team member. I just, I can't be the only, the only coach in the space. If fear was not a factor, how would you show up in your work? Ooh. I actually appreciate fear being a factor in my work. And the reason I say that is because I have a deep integrity to not do further harm, especially because the people I work with, I know, come to me with lived experience of trauma. So fear keeps my ego in check. Fear keeps me humble enough to do this work and know that I do it well, but in my lane so I don't go steering around into places I shouldn't be. So it's probably one of the few times where fear is invited in a very understand, like I understand the relationship I have with it because it's there to remind me not to steer too far out and not to let my ego take over where I, I think I can be someone's messiah when I'm not anyone's messiah. Um, yeah, from a business perspective, I don't have a lot of fear. I do stuff all the time that I just, I go rogue all the time because I love new ideas and I'm pretty brave like that. <laughs> um, so I like the fact that fear sits in this space for me. So fear as a safety Mm, fear is a safety and fear is a boundary to ensure that I am doing everything in my power to create safety, knowing that it is not always implied. Mm -hmm. Where can <laughs> people connect with you? Because right now they're racing. <laughs> How can they connect um, with you? Where can they find you? So my website is carolinebruni.com. Um, there you'll find links to all my socials. I'm probably most active on Instagram which is Caroline underscore Bruni um, on my website are all the links to where you can purchase my book and, and listen to it. So if you're an audible person, you can download, like click the link there. If you purchase a hard copy from my website, I sign it and send it to you. So that's a bit special. Could you grab the book and hold it up for those who are yeah. watching um, so that they can get to see this beautiful hard covered book. And I want to do something, Caroline. I want to give away some books. So if That's you're exciting. listening, <laughs> if you're, li of course you're listening. What am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> if they're still listening, because it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> you're still here. I trust you are. Um, I'd love you to share this episode on your Instagram stories or even your page if you feel called to and tag Caroline and myself so that we can reshare and let us know what was your takeaway for me that 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 last was the end um, about the adult and the interaction mm -hmm. and to pay attention and not kind of make your children have to hug somebody or say hello to somebody that's been my biggest takeaway so far um, let us know what your takeaway was and then you will go into a draw. You'll go into a draw to win a copy of Caroline's book. And I'm giving away three copies. So please, if this has touched you, if you believe that this would be uh, something that somebody might find of value, please go ahead and share. The more we share, the more we can get this uh, important information out. So once again, share on your Instagram stories or your page, tag Caroline, myself, and I'll pop that. Um, the links will be in the show notes and share your takeaway. And then you'll go in the draw to win one of Caroline's books. Wonderful. I'll sign it for you. <laughs> All right. Beautiful. Caroline, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing so generously. I know this is not easy, but you do it with so much grace. You do it with so much tenderness, with love, and I am so grateful for you. Thank you for all you do. 
Oh, thank you, Annie. It was wonderful to be held by you and, and have this chat. We are represented. We are represented. We are represented. Thank you so much for tuning in. Why don't you go ahead and hit that subscribe button and leave a review so this podcast can reach more online business owners and together we can begin to normalize racial inclusion in the online coaching space. I'd love to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where this podcast episode was recorded, the Wiradjuri people in central New South Wales, Australia. Music produced in Nairobi, Kenya by Patrick St. P. Mbaru and Kambua Mathu. Vocals by Joanne Matata. Represented. Represented.